All right, good morning once again. If you're new here, my name is Clay, one of the pastors, along with Mark, and you're joining us as we continue in our series, doing a little bit of a flyover of the book of Proverbs. And now one thing about the book of Proverbs is that it's a super practical book. It gives us so much practical wisdom, but if you've taken the opportunity to read it, you'll see that it, it actually deals with a broad range of topics. But through it all, there's a unifying bond that brings us all the way back to understanding that the wisdom that is contained within this book, it's not just wisdom passed down through the ages of wise older men, but it's actually God's wisdom given to us through God himself to Solomon so that we can now live a life filled with wisdom by God's design. And just as with the rest of scripture though, Proverbs, it, like I said, it truly is God's word given to us to better understand God's love for us, though. It's not just a book telling us how to live and what to do, but it tells us about who God is. So we get to see his character. And even though Jesus isn't mentioned explicitly in the book of Proverbs, he's all over it. And the book continually points us back to the beauty of the gospel. So even when we see instructions for how to live a wise life, the goal is not to just follow the instructions, but to really see this amazing God who loved us enough to enter into our mess, to live the life that we should have lived in perfect wisdom, to die the death that we should have died because of our foolishness and to rise again, defeating our enemies of Satan, sin, death, and hell so that we can be brought into the kingdom of God to follow after him into newness of life that is governed by the amazing purity of the wisdom of God that we get to live in. So once we know this God then that we see through the book of Proverbs, this is what actually drives us through a love and appreciation for who he is to now follow the the words of wisdom, to actually live out the wisdom that we see in Proverbs as best as we can, knowing that we still need the Spirit of God to work in us and through us to actually live out this wisdom that it talks about here. So, with all that as our little preamble, let's open up the book of Proverbs. We're going to be in chapter 5 today. I know we keep saying that it's a flyover and then we tackle like these entire chapters at once, but trust me, next week we're going to be kind of skipping around a little bit more. It'll be a little bit more topical and Mark's going to bring us through some some different areas of Proverbs. It won't just be a single chapter at a time. But if you're looking for chapter 5 in the book of Proverbs, it's going to be right near the middle of your Bible. It's right after the book of Psalms. And if you feel like using paper version or app version, either is okay. If you you can't find it, the uh, table of contents should hopefully be easy to find in your paper Bible. And if you have an app version, then the search function usually works pretty good, even if you don't have internet. So before we read the scripture together, which is something we typically do together. I just want to give a little bit of a, not a warning, because some of you might be really excited that we're in Proverbs chapter 5 today, but also just an awareness that because we're in Proverbs chapter 5, you're going to have, for those of you who have kids, you're going to have some opportunities to have some good discussions with your kids later today about what did he mean when he said that. So if you know Proverbs 5, maybe some of you have it tattooed and you're really excited about going through this, and if some of you have never read the Bible before, you might go, what's, so, what's the big deal about Proverbs chapter 5? Well, it's a good reason to take it out and actually look through it, and not just assume that what I'm teaching is what it says. So bring it out, and then we'll read it together. But before we do that, like I always like to do, let's just pray so that we're setting our hearts right to hear from God's Word. Father, we thank you so much that we have your Word, that we have this amazing gift from you so that we can get to better know you and love you and appreciate you. I thank you for the beauty that is held in your word. I pray that we would see it as beautiful this morning, that we would recognize the amazing truth that you have in here that points us back to the gospel, that points us back to your love for us, Jesus, your appreciation for us, your sacrifice for us. Please open our eyes and our ears this morning to hear what you want us to hear. Use my words to glorify yourself. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so if I've piqued your interest enough, Let's uh, read through Proverbs chapter 5 together. Usually we'd have it on the screen, but I'm going to read it today because, like we mentioned the last few weeks, we're giving Erwin the summer off from doing scripture videos. So let's start. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion, and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps follow the path to Sheol. 
she does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her. Do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. At the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. So that's a long passage, and we will cover most, if not all, of it actually today. And I know sometimes you think I go long after a few verses, but we'll do our best to keep this in check. But if we start with the first two verses, we're really going to see that it, it, it sounds like he's starting out a very similar way to what Mark brought out last week in chapter 4. He says, My son, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion, and your lips may guard knowledge. And if you can remember back to last week, Mark did a great job of helping us see once again that God's wisdom will lead to life. There's an abundance of life to be had when you follow God's plans and his ways. And then even better is knowing that when we fail, like we will, when we act foolishly, for those who have been reconciled to Jesus, Jesus graciously forgives us and then equips us to now continue on in following and getting on the path of obedience. And now part of the obedience is actually heeding the reminders that we see in Scripture, taking the rebukes and the, the reproofs. And when we come up against things in Scripture and we see, oh, I've not been doing that, it's an opportunity to repent, to turn away from our sin, to turn back to Jesus and follow his ways once again. Now, one of the warnings that Solomon is reminding the reader of again and again, if you read through the book of Proverbs, is you see he warns us again against adultery. He says, flee from it. And not only do we see it in chapters 5, but also in chapter 6 and 7 right away here. So the same warnings over and over again for three chapters, you might think, well, that sounds a little excessive. So why would Solomon feel the need to devote three chapters, three chapters in a row, no less, to the topic of adultery? Now, to answer this question, I think we need to go all the way back to the beginning, the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of all creation. In the, in the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings, we're told in the beginning, there was God. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God. So before anything was, there was God. And we find elsewhere in scripture that God existed and still exists in perfect love, unity, and harmony as three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the outflow of his love and his unity is that God created the universe that we live in. Now, in all of the creative order that he has done, there was one creature that God saw fit to endow with his image or his likeness. And that was humanity. That's us. We humans were designed to reflect the glory of God to the rest of creation, including that means to one another. We're supposed to image forth who God is. And so, as a part of the picture of reflecting who God is, God created man and woman in his image. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God had created this pair, this duo, for one another to be a picture of his love, of his character. See, man by himself, Adam, the first man, he couldn't image forth God by himself, even in the perfect relationship he had with God. 
many times we think if we get back to the original idea of, of the garden, or it can just be me and Jesus, and that's the perfect. But even in that instance, God said it was not good. Adam could not f- properly fulfill God's intended design all by himself. So that's why God said it's not good for man to be alone. And then we see as the writer of Genesis zooms into the creation of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in Genesis 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So God creates the woman, Eve. And then once this happens, both Adam and God rejoice in this amazing creation that God has given of the first woman. And we read this in verses 24 and 25 of chapter 2 in Genesis still. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So it's declared right at the beginning, as men and women are both created, that God's design would be for man to leave his father and mother and then join together with his wife to become one flesh, completely naked and unashamed, not just physically, but in every sense. And then we see the story move forward and we understand that God's design was for the marriage to be a picture of God. With man and woman formed together in unity with one another then, they were also unified with God in this perfect harmony. It was a small picture of the Trinity. And for a while, it was glorious. There was perfect unity between God, Adam, and Eve. But then it doesn't take long before everything falls apart because in chapter 3, just one chapter later, for what we see, and we don't know how much time spanned, but it could have been weeks, could have been thousands of years for all we know, but another character enters the story. It's a snake, a slithery, seductive snake, hell-bent on corrupting this amazingly beautiful picture of God's glory. And with a few simple words, rebellion enters the hearts of our first parents. They believe the lie that God didn't have their best at heart just like so many of us consistently believe. And all it took was this seductive question. Did God really say? And as they considered the question, they began to doubt God's goodness. They doubted his protection. They doubted his love. And so this caused a separation between God and humanity, and thus begins the spiral of sin that we now see ourselves living in today with all the destruction and devastation around us. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story, because otherwise we'd be toast, we'd be done for. But God, he he said he's not done with us. He wasn't done loving his creation. He wasn't done allowing humanity to be that picture of his love and his unity. But it did mean that doing so, reflecting God, would be a lot harder. The marriage relationship, the one that was designed to most clearly resemble this amazingly beautiful picture of God, it would constantly be under attack throughout the ages. From that first fall till now, it's consistently under attack. But we find that there's also something else to the story as well. A few thousand years later, it's revealed a little bit more because the Apostle Paul, he helps fill us in on what this mystery is in his letter to the Ephesians. If you look at Ephesians 5, verses 31 and 32, Paul ends up quoting the same thing we just read in Genesis. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Then he goes on to say, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So he's saying that marriage wasn't just meant to be this picture of God's love in an abstract way, but this was actually supposed to be a picture and truly reflect God's love for his bride, the church. Jesus' love for the church. This is what marriage was supposed to point us to. And just a few verses earlier, Paul was telling husbands that their role is to love their wives as Christ loved the church, giving himself up for her. And that's because in marriage, especially for us as men, we have this amazing opportunity to live out the beauty of the relationship that Jesus has with his church and the beauty that Jesus continually wants to have with us. So there's an intimacy, there's a oneness, there's a passion that Jesus has for us, his bride, that just can't be matched by anything else. There's not another picture that Jesus wants to to image who he is and how much he loves us. So the only picture that comes close is the picture of marriage. And like I said before, from the beginning of time, 
this has been under attack. The two things that seem to be under attack most is this relationship we have with God, with, with just us and God, but then also the relationship husbands and wives are to have with each other. These things are constantly under attack. And I believe this is why Solomon devotes three chapters to warning us, to warning his sons, as, as well as anyone else who's reading this, to stay away from adultery. Stay away from anything that distorts this amazingly beautiful picture of God's love for us. It's serious. Now, I think, too, that this is one of the reasons that many of the Old Testament prophets actually use the language of adultery when they're speaking about Israel's rebellion, when they continuously ignored God's command and willfully chose to wander away from worshiping God and, and worshiped idols and false gods. Now, if you're married, you don't probably have to think too hard of the kind of pain that would be caused by adultery. And yet that's the very same pain that God experiences every single time we sin. When we choose to go our own way, when we think that something else can satisfy us more than Jesus does, when we think that we can be a better God than God, we end up choosing to worship someone else or something else. And when we do that, we're succumbing to the sweet speech of that forbidden woman that Solomon talks about. So when Solomon warns us about staying away from adultery, he's actually not just talking about physical adultery. He's using it as an example of all sin, just like the prophets did. And that's because all sin is offensive. It's grievous to God. And yet, at the very same time, every single sin has different consequences. And there's different ways that each sin will lie about who God is and who we are. So even in using this as an example of all sin, I think it's still important and good to warn us about the specific sin. Because the way this sin hits so hard at God's glory and the design that he has for us as his people. So in a very real and practical way, Solomon, Solomon he's warning men, especially, though you could say this applies to women as well, to do all we can to stay away from these temptations. Because there's going to be many of these. They're going to come again and again. Now, one thing we also need to know about this is that sex is not a byproduct of chance. It wasn't just that God said, okay, I'm going to create the man and woman and we'll see what happens. He designed it. And it was God's good idea from the very beginning, which means that the, the drives and desires that we have as men and women, they're given to us by God, by God to glorify him, to make much of him. That means God wants men and women to get married, to enter into that covenant relationship where you both say, I'm not going anywhere, and then enjoy one another with the freedom that can only come from that covenant, all because it helps us to understand who God is. It's not just for us to enjoy that act in and of itself, but it's to help us see the beauty and the glory and the majesty of God. But once again, just like with everything else, we're prone to distort God's good gifts to us. And that means there's going to be temptations for us to look outside the covenant, whether it's before we're in the covenant or after we're in the covenant. And we just want to think of our own feelings, ignoring God's amazing commands that actually lead to life. So verses 7 to 14 tell us this. We'll read it again. And now, O sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. At the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed and you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. So Solomon tells us that when we give into the temptation, it's not going to lead to what we're promised. It's not going to lead to fullness. It's not going to lead to everlasting joy. It's going to lead to death and ruin. So then in response, in verses 15 to 17, Solomon now wants to paint a picture of what it actually looks like to joyfully experience the fruits of the marriage covenant. He says, Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. 
Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. So first he uses this language of drinking water from your cistern. If you don't know what a cistern is, the cistern, at that time at least, would have been this giant well that would be both for you and your family, maybe your, your town, but it would be for, that was yours. That was exclusively yours. And cisterns were so important, in fact, that battles were often fought over cisterns and, and who they belonged to. And so he uses this picture to talk about the marriage covenant. So he's really reminding us men in particular, if you're thirsty, get your drink at home. So that means you don't get your drink from your neighbor's cistern. You don't get your drink from the cistern on TV or the internet. You don't get your drink from your coworker or your customer at work. You get to drink from the cistern that belongs to you. But he's saying the drives and the desires that you have, that God has created in you, for men, they were made for you to pursue your wife. That's it. But notice too, he says that the water should be flowing. This means it shouldn't get stale and stagnant. It means if you're married, you need to use the water. You need to cultivate the relationship. You need to tend and manage your own cistern. So both husbands and wives, this means you need to make sure the cistern is available for one another. And then it's well used. Now, obviously, there's times when the cistern needs to be out of order for a bit. It needs to be cleaned. But like Paul says to the Corinthian church, those times should be few and far between. Paul says, accompanied by prayer. And then I'll add, accompanied by patience and understanding. Now, in so many religions, sex is an act of worship to false gods. Fertility temples were a normal thing to observe in ancient and Greek and Roman culture. But the truth is, that doesn't mean that for Christians, sex ceases to be an act of worship. Because like with everything that we've been given, Christians are called to worship God with whatever we do. We're told that we're to give our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable as an act of worship to God. So everything we do should be in worship to God. So for those of you who are married, when we enjoy sex in the covenant and the freedom of marriage, this is actually a beautiful act of worship to our creator and savior who made us to enjoy this. Now, verses 18 and 19, they're really going to paint a picture of the freedom that comes with enjoying that relationship. He says, let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. A lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. Now, if you've never read through the Bible before, maybe you didn't know that this kind of language, it's actually in the Bible. I, like, look it up. I'm not just making it up because I want to. This is here. And it, it, this is in Proverbs, no less. Like we mentioned at the start of the series, this was a book given to boys to better understand what it looks like to grow up to be a godly man of God. Now, so many people have this false idea about what they think the Bible must say about sex as if it's this thing to be avoided, if at all possible. And then, only then, if you're married, then you do this as a duty, it's in, to be endured. But that's not the picture the Bible gives of sex. It doesn't paint this grim picture. God created it to be enjoyed by husband and wife. And God actually wants our kids to know about it. This is why it's in Proverbs. So that they can look forward to it and to understand that this is a gift of God for husband and wife to truly enjoy. Now, it's actually pretty sad that most kids, it seems like their first exposure to the concept is from other kids at school who are crudely joking about it. Or maybe on TV, where it's not talked about in a God-glorifying way. But the truth is, sex within marriage is not the butt end of a joke. And it's, it's not just some dreary deed to be tolerated. I mean, just look at the language that's used. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Be filled with delight. Be intoxicated in her love. That's, that's exciting language. So whether you've been married five or 50 years, that's a picture of joy and freedom, isn't it? 
This is something God delights in. So he's not just saying that it's a duty-bound, joyless marriage that you have to endure. This sounds like words that are meant to invoke a lot of fun. So we have to remember that this is Solomon writing the words of God, encouraging us to enjoy our spouses. It's a good thing, to the point of intoxication, no less. Now, how many of us just really needed to see that today? God's letting you know that it's not just okay for you to desire and want to physically be with your spouse. It's not just okay, but it's actually God's plan that you really, really enjoy each other. It's an amazing gift. But we have to realize that that takes work, doesn't it? I mean, if you're going to still love and appreciate the woman that you've been married to for 50 years, you're going to have to keep your eyes for your wife only. You can't be looking around, indulging your eyes, and preparing to embrace someone else, whether with your eyes, your hands, or otherwise. So as a sobering reminder, this is what Solomon says in verses 20 to 23. He says, Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman, and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast by the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. So he's saying, why would you throw away all the joy, the love, the excitement, and commitment you can have with your wife? Why would you just throw that all away? And he says, besides, we have to remember, God's watching. He knows when you click that link. He's not unaware of the messages you're replying to. He's with you when you're making those plans. And if you continue that, down that path, he says, you're going to fall right into the snare of the devil. You'll die because of lack of discipline. And God knows if you do not discipline yourself, you're going to have to fall into the hands of God's discipline. So do you know that it takes discipline to keep your marriage healthy? You want to enjoy verses 15 to 18, it's going to take discipline. So men, do you recognize that it takes discipline to love your wife, to engage her, to pursue her, to deny yourself? Ladies, do you know it takes discipline to be attentive to your husband, to honor him, to deny yourself? And for those of you who aren't yet married, or maybe you were married, you need to know that it's going to take discipline for you as well to keep yourself from indulging purely in your own desires. It's going to take discipline to be the right person that you want your future spouse to be attracted to. It's going to take discipline to deny yourself as well. It doesn't matter if you're married or not married. We all need the discipline of denying ourselves for the sake of the glory of God. But that's what's going to lead to greater joy but we need to understand that in order to de be disciplined, we just can't do it on our own because true discipline comes from being discipled. So if we want to be disciplined, we, we need to realize who are we being discipled by? Because we're always being discipled by someone. Someone's trying to influence us and we're accepting influence from everywhere. So we need to think, are, are we succumbing to the smooth words of the seductive snake who is constantly going to ask us, did God really say, did God really say that sex should be saved for marriage? Did God really say that you can't look at a man or a woman lustfully who's not your spouse? Did God really say that marriage is for one man and one woman for a lifetime? Are we listening to the snake? Or do we have a godly desire to be disciplined by the one who created us in his image? Now, here's the thing. We need, we need to know that we've all bought the lies before. Not one of us is pure. We've taken the bait, we've bit the hook, and in one way or another, if we're honest with ourselves, we haven't been the people we want to be, let alone the people God wants us to be. But there's beauty in that Jesus 
already knew that that was going to happen. He loves you. And like a good husband who pursues his bride, even if she's betrayed him, Jesus continues to forgive us. And he also continues to wash us, making us clean in his sight. That means if you've messed up sexually, if you've been unfaithful to Jesus, you need to know that there's forgiveness. It's not the end for you. And Jesus is continuing to invite you to experience him in fullness. And one of the ways he puts it is drinking from an unending supply of water. Now, in John's gospel account, we end up learning of this woman who had been with multiple different men. Now, we don't know whether she was the kind of woman we're reading about here in chapter 5, the adulteress, or if she was used and abused and thrown out only to be used and abused by somebody else. We don't know which one she may have been. But either way, Jesus comes up to her and, and he asks her for a drink of water. Might not sound weird to you, but she replies that what he's asking for is just not done in that culture. It's, it's just too scandalous. Talk about scandal. This is coming from a woman who's been married five times. That's scandalous. And she's saying that Jesus asking for water, that's just so far scandalous. I can't even believe it. But then in verse 10 of John chapter 4, this is what we read. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. We need to understand that Jesus is offering this water to us as well. She had messed up. We've messed up the same way. She was offered the water. We get that same water offered to us. It means it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. Jesus is offering us to take part in a cistern that will lead to greater joy than anything else we could imagine. The amazing gift of sex and marriage is but a picture of the joy that we get in Jesus. If we want a healthy marriage, we first need to start with the water that comes from Jesus' cistern. If we want to enjoy our marriages to the fullest, we need to resist temptation to, to pursue our spouses for the glory of God. When, when we do these things, we need to recognize that we can only do them if Jesus is at work in us. So that means we need to first experience the love of God through Jesus. We need to receive this living water that he's offering us. And it's only then that we can actually fully receive the ability to be disciplined enough to pursue our spouses and then enjoy the amazing fruits that come with that. But the beauty is that as we do that, let's first go to those who aren't married. As you pursue Jesus, allow Jesus to build in you the strength of character that's going to allow you to actually enjoy the gift of singleness that you currently have either unless or until Jesus decides it's time for you to now enjoy the gift of marriage. Because both can and are a gift. But both need to be understood in the context of who we are in Christ. And then for those of you who are married, we see clearly that one of the jobs you have is to enjoy your spouse. Not just tolerate with them. Not to just put up with the fact that you're married, but enjoy them. Pursue them. Stop being so selfish. Because we've been pursued by Jesus, the completely unselfish one. And who has more joy than Jesus? And then, be intoxicated with your spouse's love. Be intoxicated with it. And do it as an act of worship to Jesus. Because he created this amazing gift for you to enjoy as a picture of his love for us, the church. So Jesus, I just want to thank you for this amazing gift. Thank you that you've given it to your people as a way to better understand your character. Thanks that you've created all the joys of the pleasure, both physically, mentally, and spiritually, that we get to experience, and that it continuously points us back to the amazing God that you are. Help us not to abuse this gift, Help us not to ignore this gift. 
but help us to truly worship you with this amazing gift because you are worthy of our worship and everything. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.